Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Curious Competitor Podcast. Our guest today, a uh, former uh, Toronto Maple Leaf teammate of mine. It doesn't really matter. Hey, Frankie, you can play anywhere else, uh, but you're always a, a former Toronto Maple Leaf. Uh, our guest today Great. is Frankie Corrado, um, you know, fellow right-handed defenseman, uh, fellow OHL alumni. I uh, had a lot of respect when I first ran into Frankie's game, you know, as a Sudbury Wolf. Um I believe you were a part of, you got moved at that deadline, right? Uh, to Kitchener yeah. when we went right. to the Western Conference Finals and lost to London. You guys were another heavyweight team. You had yourself, Radic Fox. Uh, I think John Gibson was in net. Uh, yeah. We had uh, Murphy, Ryan Murphy, uh, Josh yeah. Levo, Matt Pumple. Um, we had a good team. We had a good team, but we ran into those London Knights. Looking back at that roster now, that was a, that was a heavyweight team. They had Horvat, Domi, Griffith, Harrington. Um, Stolars and Nets, Zadora, Chris Tierney, yeah. Josh Anderson. Yeah. yeah, you go down their lineup, it's like they that they got NHL players that were playing on their third and fourth line. So it just shows goes I to remember show you how deep that team was. The, the OHL was, and we can maybe start there. You know, I, I think, uh, I wonder if our development was the same, right? Because we were kind of, you know, the, the new age defensemen, right? Two-way guys, puck movers, uh, good offensively. I, I really liked your game and, and remember you well uh, from playing against you in Sudbury. And I thought you were even better with Kitchener just because you had more talent to work with. And that team was, you know, really high end. But like the OHL to me, I don't know what your relationship with it, but as an American kid, it was like taboo. It was like the... Yeah, it, it, it was something. It was something like every player wanted to look at, but no one, you know, really wanted to have the guts to go. Um, you know, a couple of us did from that U.S. development team. Eventually, made the jump, and it was really catapulted my career. I, you know, played the U.S. development team. Didn't love it. I've talked about that on this podcast. Like, you know, the, just the style of play, um, you know, the depth that we had on defense. Uh, just frankly, the way they treated. You know, certain players, I, I wasn't in, you know, good favor there. And then the OHL, just with the the amount of games you played, the quality of competition, like we just talked about, um, you know, put me on the map. What was, you know, your youth experience growing up in the, you know, greater Toronto area and eventually, you know, making the decision to go to the OHL? I don't Yeah, I've probably told this a few times and I don't know if we've ever talked about it on the bus or the plane or anything like that. But like my youth hockey experience was a little different. I got cut a couple a couple times on the way up and wasn't I was big and then everyone else grew and I was small. And then one summer I hit this spurt, got in the gym a little bit, went back on the ice. I was like, oh, wow, I'm actually fast this year. Look at that. Like I can I can carry the puck this year. No one seems to be taking it off me. This is kind of nice. And that was leading up to the the draft year. And so things started going pretty good in my minor midget season. And you know the way it goes. Things start to pick up. Agents call the house. And all of a sudden, the OHL teams are calling, see if you had any interest. And one of the teams that liked to call the house to, to see how it was doing was Sudbury. And I remember telling my agent, he's like, listen to me. Tell Sudbury you're not reporting. You're not going up to Sudbury. <laughs> and I was like, why? He goes, just, you're not going. Okay, no problem. So I told Sudbury a couple times. So oh, it's great. Thanks for calling. Like, but not coming. Okay. <laughs> so, and then I think at one point they even scheduled uh, meetings, like in-person meetings for players down by the airport in Toronto. I get a call one day. Hey, Frank, you missed your meeting. Uh, where are you? Like, oh, I told you I'm not coming to Sudbury. I don't know what to tell you, right? <laughs> yeah, be it. So, I already told you, no, yeah, we're not going to dance. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So anyways, I, I eventually kind of land in this this like area of the draft where I'm probably going to go be- anywhere between 15 and 25. And uh, so 15 comes up and it's Mississauga and they take Stuart Percy, who I'm a huge fan of his game. I thought he was awesome. I don't know about what I you remember about him. Please. I remember him well. So much, so much poise with the puck. Like I think the knock was the like the skating, but I I played with Stu on a number of occasions. I'm like this guy skates more than fine, and his poise with the puck. And the one thing about Stu, he always would hit the middle on the breakout. Like yeah. he'd just yeah. look guys off and hit the middle all the time. Like that's such an underrated skill. Um, and then so the other defensemen that were in that that kind of uh, area was Cody Cece, who's obviously in the NHL playing, doing well. 
Scotty Harrington, who's become a buddy of mine. He ended up going to London and he, Scotty pulled the old, I'm going to go NCAA, you know, and then London's going to pick him at 19 and convince him to go, which, hey, I, I have no problem with. You got to do what you got to do. But then uh, that leads, that le- kind of left me out of the mix there. And so then 25 came around and Sudbury comes up on the mic and we're watching. And we're kind of in my living room. And we're like, well, there's no way they're going to pick me because they picked a defenseman in the first round already anyways. So anyways, they come on the mic. They're like, oh, yeah, we select from the Vaughn Kings, Frankie Corrado. And we're sitting there we're like happy. It's great. But like, we're like, what is going on here? We told them we're not, I'm not going. So it actually worked in our favor because we kind of said like, I don't know about you growing up. Was like education a big thing for you? Like, did you have to have good marks? It was huge. It was, uh, you know, my mom was the driver of that at home and, and I was a good student anyway. Like I really enjoyed it. And it, it generally, you know, came pretty easy to me minus the, the hockey stress. I was like you, right. Playing yeah. every Friday, you know, yeah. tired, you know, uh, slugging ass on Monday just from, you know, playing five games in two and a half days. Oh. Yeah, we did, we had we had games like our minor midget games were nine o'clock at night, you know, yeah. so it was it was it was a bit of a struggle at times. But like education was always like, you know, got to get good marks in my house. And so um, we kind of took that opportunity to say, like, hey, we're just going to talk to some schools now and, and see what's cooking there. And um, unless you really want to come with a really good education package, right, because all, all of a sudden we had some leverage there. So had some trips lined up to go see some schools. And uh, sure enough. Sudbury kind of checked all the boxes as far as the education package and so we were happy with that we felt pretty comfortable and then the other thing too when you're in Ontario it's like do you want to I don't want to say waste two years but do you want to play two years of provincial junior a when you could have been playing in the OHL against the best players right so that was my decision to go to Sudbury and honestly I loved it I had a great three and a half years there met a lot of great people still have some friends that live in town I think the support system there from ownership down through the management and coaches was really good and um so I was I'm happy I ended up making that decision great jersey great Great jersey jersey. and that's that's something we've talked about in the past I know is the OHL jerseys and the logos how good of a job do they do with those? I mean, across the board. I, I uh, one of my favorite photos of my hockey career ever is still me in the dark Plymouth Whaler jersey. A lot of Knights had great jerseys. Owen Sound had great jerseys. I love Windsor's jerseys. You know, the Kitchener Rangers is a classic. Um, yeah. I mean, go up and down. Barry's got a great jersey. Who else? What was the one? I mean, like they're all good in the OHL. The, Ottawa's. I like Ottawa's with the barber pole. Yep, I, think I like Ottawa's. I like uh, even Sault Ste. Marie's. Like simple. Kind of yeah. old school, you know, like the town. I, 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 I thought the OHL as a whole, just in terms of the way they market it, and similar. Like I, I was originally drafted to Guelph. And oh I, yeah, I, I, I actually didn't know that. I sick. I had no idea. So I had no idea. You know, I never talked to Guelph, and I was a U.S. team guy, committed to Michigan, and you know, going back to the Mark saying like, in our, in our bed, in our bedroom, I shared a bedroom. My younger brother Blake, we had you know two sets of, of covers, two queen beds, and. Mine was a Michigan blank and his was a Notre Dame. And like those are my two final schools that I looked at. I loved both of them. You know, one was a little bit closer to home. They were both close enough. They were both great schools. They were both great, you know, hockey traditions. And um, I'd say the hardest decision of my life was deciding to go to the OHL. And the move was that I was already admitted to Michigan. And I had good marks, so I, I knew I'd be able to handle it. And yeah. Plymouth basically said, like, we'll pay for your schooling while you play here. And if you don't yeah. go, we'll give you the education package. That was a big deal. But like even love Guelph Storms jerseys, even then, like they had good teams. Uh, I think they had Matt Finn, who was a Leaf pick, a high second round, yeah. you know, defenseman. Yeah. Uh, Scott Kosmachuk. I'm trying to think of who else they had, you know, because I think yeah, they had right. I left. Yeah, they had. Yeah. Kirby Reichel was there after. I don't know yeah. if you ever crossed paths with him. Yeah. He's a he's a funny guy. Um, but they, they actually, we ran into them in the playoffs my last year and they were that team that was up and coming and we beat yeah. them in five, but that was a hard, that was a hard series. They made it hard on us for sure. We had the edge. Yeah. I think John Gibson wins us that series for sure. What a freak athlete he was. I ran into him at the U S team and we were playing, uh, I, I, I love telling like certain stories cause you like you, you run into certain athletes and you know, we're all the modern player we're all in a training now and and things like that and john was a goaltender like 16 years old 17 years old that u.s development team 
hang cleaning like 330 pounds. It's like crazy, it a, hey? Like it was a chew toy. Like, yeah, yeah. And then I remember we were playing basketball one time. I thought this was sick. We we're playing like the 17s versus the 18s in basketball. And I wasn't great at basketball or kicks for that matter. Um, and uh, like I go to pump fake and John goes up the block. And so I pump fake and I've got him and I go to reach around him. And he goes up north and then he decides he does a full toe touch midair where his, his hands come down to his feet and he lifts his feet up and he blocks my pass with his foot in the air. I was like, yeah. this guy's a monster. That's a freak athlete. My, I, so when I got to Kitchener, we were doing this drill in practice where it's almost like a three-on-one down low. And then the forwards have to go out outside the blue line, all regroup, and we'll do a three on one back into the like towards the net. It's basically just to get the forwards to touch the puck and score some goals, get them feeling good. And so if you were doing that drill, would you not try and take away the back door? Would that not be your as a defenseman? Yeah, You're looking to take away the back. Yeah, exactly. So I'm doing that, right? And he taps me the next before we start the next rep. He goes, Hey, he goes, You take the slot, I'll take the back door. I was like, wait a second, what? So I did it. I take away the slot. Sure enough, this puck zings across the crease. And all of a sudden, Gibby's just there. And he's not only is he there, he's like square to it. You know, there's a difference between goalies that just like get a pad on it or they hope and save it. This guy was like, no, right into the bread basket. I'm like, okay, this guy's very legit. Very legit goaltender. So you would say overall, the OHL was a very good move for your hockey career. Um, yeah, I, yeah I guy going into pro. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Was, you know what? Like the ice is always there for you when you want it. Not that it might not be in other places, but like you know, high school we'd finish at twelve or two, depending on your schedule. You go, the ice is there, it's open. You can shoot some pucks before practice, stay on later after practice. Like when high school was done. We would go for breakfast club, it's called, in the morning, 9 a.m., do some goalie ice, go on in a track suit. Like, just think about how good you can get at hockey when you have that at your disposal at any given moment. So I don't know if I would have got that playing two or three years of Provincial Junior A and then waiting to go NCAA, plus all the games, 68 games a year, scouts are in the house, like, once, plus playoffs, right? Yeah, seven-game series, which I thought was a huge development point for me getting yeah. to play in, in, in real series with, you know, best on best. Guys are playing, you know, 25 to 30 minutes a night, you know, power yeah. play, yeah. playing the full two. National broadcast, like nat- like they had the yeah. national broadcast, right? So I'm involved in that right now with TSN, but, we'll, like, we'll get to that after. But um, how about – so you were in the West, so you would have yeah. only played Brampton and Mississauga once a year in their yep. barn, right? Once yep. there, once oh, – so we played in that division. And so we played them six to eight times a year, each team. So that's three or four times in their barn. The amount of scouts on a Sunday afternoon in Brampton or Mississauga, there was like a section and it was all just guys in black jackets and black clipboards. It was like, there could have been a hundred guys on a Sunday afternoon. So what a great opportunity. Yeah, I agree. And, and it, it, really gave you a chance like there were always on almost every team bonafide nhl prospects like someone that you know if they had three top three round picks you knew one or two of them were going to play for sure uh and as a top player you're gonna get a chance to play against them and, and prove yourself like i remember even my first year i think erie you know that was the year they had connor mcdavid as a 15 year old and yeah. like they had connor brown they had oscar danskin net who was a high pick they had adam pellick and like this team won like seven games, eight games. Yeah, they were they were brutal that year. And they still had, you know, some high end, you know, players still in their lineup. And you're like, I mean, even the forwards I got to play with, Stefan Nason, Vince Trocek, Ricard Raquel, Tom Wilson, Ryan Hartman. Yeah. Uh you guys were a tough team to play against. That was we Plymouth. Loaded. When you already played Timoth, it was Plymouth, it was gonna be a tough game. Yeah, we were loaded. Um good coach I, too. Yeah, and Mike Lewis had a good coach. Now. Yeah. Yeah, um, so help me, help me understand, you know, because I kept my eye on you also when you were really young playing with Vancouver. I uh, had the uh, had the good fortune to do that too, and I know just how hard and and trying the NHL game is compared to junior. 
and you've got the ice time factor. You're not playing 30 minutes a night to get the feel uh, like you would. The game is so much sneakier, so much more structured, so much bigger, so much tougher. Uh, the jumps way faster. Um, everything about it. You know, what, what do you remember as a as a 20 year old playing playing games in National Hockey League? I think we both did it too, wearing number 58 at the time. Were we yeah, not? Were yeah, we yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. Um, yeah. So the season had just finished in Kitchener. We got knocked out. I went to Chicago, played a couple of games. That was Vancouver's AHL affiliate. And I got a call. I was supposed to go Black Ace in Vancouver. And I got a call saying, hey, um, instead of coming to Black Ace next week, you're just going to come a week earlier because we have a bunch of injuries and you'll, you'll play against Chicago on Monday. So obviously surreal moment, really cool. And, um, but when you talk about actually playing and getting in the situation, the, the biggest thing I can say is I was so naive to everything. You know, you're just naive to the consequences on the ice if you do certain things or you're just like in this, like it's just this outer outer body experience where you're just out there and playing and you don't even realize that you're in the NHL yet because it hasn't quite hit you. Like I, I found that. I don't know if you had a different experience than me. Did you find that you were like almost naive to everything around you at that time? There were, there were absolutely. And then there were certain things that – I absolutely needed explained to me about the game that no one did that totally caught me by surprise. So for example, you'll know this, you, you know, you've played professional hockey at a high level now for a long time, defensive zone draw, both defensemen. If you're on your strong sides, you're usually exiting out the weak side, right? You're going to go bump. You know, if you're playing with a left shot, he's going to bump it to you. You're going to wheel behind the net, come out the right side of the net, vice versa on the other side of the rink. If you flip sides, you're usually going to flip it strong side out. You might run some reverse, but usually you're going to flip it strong side out or make some middle play with the lefty sweeping yep. the puck underneath the, the left dot and the righty's going to hold on the wall. Jack Hillen was my deep partner, and we decided to go strong side out. He, he says, line up over there. I'm like, oh, all right, fine. And he goes, uh, hey, hold your guy up. I'm like, all right, you got it, man. I'll hold him up. <laughs> So I, I hold him up for like a second because if you hold him up for three seconds, it's interference. Like that's a yeah. penalty, right? I just yeah. think. And so we win the draw. It's on my sort of corner. He goes back to flip it. I hold my guy up for a second. He, my guy goes and blows Jack up, smokes him. <laughs> right? We get back and, and Jack, who is already one of the grumpiest guys I've ever played with. <laughs> he's like, hey, man, I fucking told you to hold that guy up. <laughs> And I'm like, and I'm a punk kid. I'm like, I did. And he's like, yeah. like, you know, no, you need to hold him up. I'm like, all right, you got it, man. So next shift, you know, we get out there, D-zone draw. He goes, we're going strong side out. Hold him up this time. I'm like, hold him up. I go, you got it, bro. <laughs> I hold him up. I give him like a one, one thousand, one and a half. My guy goes and blows Jack up again. <laughs> again. Uh <-huh. laughs> We get back to the bench. It's like, dude, I fucking told you, you have to hold that guy up. And so, like, I just, I didn't know that every, I mean, if you watch NHL night, there's an interference off 100% of faceoffs. It's a I, I could chime, I could chime in here on, on that because, so my first year pro, this is after I had made my debut after junior, I'm playing third, like I'm called up. Vancouver carried 8D. Okay. So if okay. I'm called up and I'm playing, that means there are, the sixth guy, the seventh guy, and the eighth guy are all hurt. So that's how dire the situation is at this point. So I'm called up and I'm playing. And so they have me playing my offside, and I'm playing with Yannick Weber, smaller puck-moving guy, bomb of a shot. And Webby did really well for himself over his career. But anyways, we get into a D-zone draw situation, and I'm the board side guy. And at this point... Um, I've kind of figured out that like, okay, I, I understand my, my role, right? My responsibility. I need to hold this guy up. Like you just said, right? So I think we're playing LA and I'm in this situation where I'm in the, on the third pair, but I'm not necessarily playing a regular ship. You ever get yeah. that over your career? Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're playing like, yes, yeah. max. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it ends up being like five or six minutes because you'll only get out there if the fourth line is out for sure. And it's like, the whistle, the, the, the two finger whistle goes and it's like, whoever's on the ice, get off. So Frankie can go on for the fourth line shift. 
you know, yep. and just eat a few, eat a, eat a minute or whatever. So anyways, I hold this guy up and I thought I did a pretty good job at it. And the whistle blows. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, like just the ref fucked up, dropping the puck. Like we're going to do it all over again. And ref goes, 26, two minutes interference. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? I'm like, I can't, I'm playing three minutes and you're going to call me on this interference off, off a of face off. Like, Pick a real call to call in the game, not this nonsense. Like, now mm-hmm. I'm done. Now I'm done because I, I only had five minutes to work with. You're That's taking right. two minutes. You're taking two minutes from me now, and I got to be in the box. You think the coach is going to put me back on the fucking ice? <laughs> you, you, you know, like, but unless you've been in that situation, you don't, you don't, like, no one would understand that, right? You know, somehow, some way, we were talking about this a little bit before we started, you know, the concept of, of luck and how it does, you know, as athletes, you're, you're taught, you're responsible for how you prepare, you're responsible for how you play, um, you know, which I believe, but there, there is a tremendous amount of luck and it, it does shape you as a person and, 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 you know, the, the, how things go or is, you know, oftentimes can be decided as neither good nor bad. It's just kind of what you do with it. Yeah. And, um, you know, I remember very similarly that I was playing in Dallas and I I'd just come back from injury. I'd just broken my leg and, you know, missed, you know, three, four months. And I was not, you know, this like every, every day, even when you're healthy is a, is a grind to stay in the NHL. And I missed, you know, three and a half months in the middle of the year. I, I didn't have that kind of leash to do that at that time. We're playing St. Louis and I'm jacked. Like I, I'm, so excited. I'd played one game prior, but we dressed seven defensemen, played like three minutes. You know, coaches like, you look slow. I'm like, yeah, I felt slow. I played three minutes. You know, thanks. Played three minutes. <laughs> like, you know, um, right, let's, that'd be like to tell a coach trying to try to coach the game with your eyes open for three minutes of the game. Like, you only get to watch three minutes and you got to coach the third period and know who's going. You know, like, yeah, yeah. just fascinating. And uh, I, I step out on a play, there's like a drop pass. I'm playing my offside, so I'm playing the left side. And I go out. It's a drop pass to Colton Pareko, who's, you know, 15 feet tall. And I go out with my stick, and the forward driving the net pops my stick, pops my stick and hits Pareko in the face two minutes, right? So, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm dead. As soon as I get back to the bench, I'm done tonight. Dude, okay. you just – how do you how do you describe the physical feeling you feel? Like, what would you get? Would you get like the the throat kind of seize up, or would you get it's, like the stomach's pit? It's like, pure, it's pure fight or flight. Like, it's pure or fun. It, it's like the, the rink gets small. You're sitting there. You're like rubbing your temples. You're like you're, yeah. you're cutting deal with Jesus Christ. You're like God. If they just don't score, like <laughs> I will do unbelievable amount of penance like i'm gonna like, i'm gonna recycle i'm gonna go to church on sunday <laughs> i will never swear again i will throw away my tv like yeah i will you know everything right i'll never yell at my dog again everything yeah so then my second shift i uh i get back out there my I'm, i think i had 13 seconds of ice time and two penalties ryan o'reilly grabs my stick you know, because he does that a lot. Like he where he grabs oh, yeah. his stick. Oh yeah. Grabs my stick and like puts it in his arm and goes down. You know, second penalty, I'm done for the night. I think I had, you know, a minute thirty worth of ice time. Yeah. Just just melting. And and you're sitting there thinking to yourself, you're like, you know, like, you know, if this game goes well, maybe I get another. Maybe I get another, but you know, just somehow, <laughs> some way, like luck plays a role. Like how you know, th- think over the course of your career. You know, where are examples, you know, for our listener, for a lot of young kids that, you know, maybe are are on the good or bad side of occurrences in their career? Like, what would be one example where you look back and you're like, wow, like I got really lucky there. That was a that was a good deal. And what yeah, would be an um, example where you were like, that is a that was raw. That was not fair in, in well, the hockey guy. I would I would say that that last year of junior for me I got off to this really hot start and I wasn't a big points guy I think the the highest points I ever had was thirty in Sudbury and okay that's fine it's almost half a point a game but that last year I was scorching hot like right out of the gate had a five point night was player of the week defenseman of the month then I get invited to um, that Subway Super Series game 
the, the OHL Remember versus that? Russia. And I score the game winning goal on Vasilevsky. And you talk about a lucky break. Like my D there was a, you know how we play now, right? You, you bring your forward up high, your F three up high, you do a little exchange with the D get a puck on net and you come downhill, you come downhill and you bury it. And so that's exactly what happened. But if they didn't do that nice exchange up top, if the puck didn't go right off the goalie's pad, right onto my stick as I'm coming downhill, I don't score that goal. So that's luck. Yeah, I did the right things. Like we talked about the preparation. I did all the right philosophies and executed. But if that puck doesn't go there, it's a nothing play in the game. But anyways, the puck goes right off Vasilevsky's pad, right on my stick, back of the net, boom. There's your game-winning goal for Team OHL against Russia. So now all of a sudden, I'm at World Juniors camp. So World Juniors camp gets going. I don't make the team, but game one, I score a goal again. I don't know, just a shot on net. I've done it a million times. I've hit shin pads. I've put it in the goalie's chest. I've missed the net, but this one went posting in like you read about. Beautiful, right? Every scout in the building, TSN, media, you name it, everyone's in the house and they just saw this guy go posting in. I'm like, that's a great feeling. Wow, that was, and that's, that's lucky. Like it is luck. Then the next game, uh, join the rush done something you've done a million times, join the rush, stop it, shoot it, another shot, goes in. Like, I scored, I just scored two goals at the World Juniors camp. I scored the game-winning goal at the Subway, Subway Super Series. Like, and these are just on plays that they could have been nothing, but the, the puck ends up going in. So there's your luck. Like, as, at the end of the day, I think that's luck. I don't know how you see it. I mean, I agree. Like, uh, you know, I look at my career, you know, a, a monumental moment. You know, Adam, Adam Oates is a coach in Washington. Adam Oates believes wholeheartedly without negotiation. He wants three defensemen on their left side. He wants three defensemen on their right side. Righties, righties and lefties, right? Righties and lefties, non-negotiable. Yeah, right. Well, they, you know, were a little wealthy on the left side in terms of, you know, they had Cameron Schilling out of Miami, who was a high-end uh, free agency sign. And they had Dmitry Orlov, who played a bunch of NHL games. On the left side, they had, uh, you know, Nate Schmidt, who had played some games and, and was another high end uh, free agent, you know, who's, uh, you know, in the NHL now. Um, I didn't really have to compete with those guys because Adam believed in right shots. And so, right. you know, for whatever reason, they were a little thin at the time. You know, it was Steve Alexi's job the year prior, who I know you know, and they decided yeah. to go with me. I was kind of young, offered a different look. You know, I was, you know, maybe a little more polished with the puck in certain ways. Um, yeah. You know, and, and, and get a huge break. All of a sudden, I'm 19 years old playing the National Hockey League. Uh, went into training camp without a deal, and, and now I'm on the opening night roster, right? Uh, get traded to, to uh, Toronto. Have that, you know, those, those handful of games down the stretch where the team, you know, was tanking for Matthews, right? Uh, you know, we, we play together. They send me down to the Marlies. We've got Stu Percy, who's very good. Uh, they had Renat Valiev, who was a high-end, you know, draft pick. They had uh, who else was on defense? You know, Victor Louv, Justin yeah, Hall, yeah, you know, Justin Hall, you know, TJ Brennan. Yeah. Um, and uh, for whatever reason, I had had a really good American League year. I was a two time HL All Star at this point. And my goal, you know, during that stretch when I was with the Leafs with you was like, okay, just prove that you can swim. Like, our, like you won't sink. Like, our, our team right. wasn't very good. Every play was like off the class because we didn't have much offensive talent down the stretch we're defending our ass off yeah show you're competitive make the plays you can you know i was nervous as hell to play for mike he, he was a he was a big you know um oh, yeah. intimidating force you know which which we can talk about and uh you know the, the way we played was very strict a couple of those things really played into how i how i played a couple of those things really hurt me um it, but all of a sudden i go down to the marley's power play First power play, non-negotiable, like tons of points, filled the net. Everything went in the net. I, I led the – Didn't you have a hat trick in the I, playoffs? I had a five-point night against Bridgeport in the playoffs. I had – I led the American League playoffs in scoring as a D-man. There you go. Not making the final. Like – Yeah. Lightning in a – like, yes, I was playing good. Yes, I had built my offensive game over two years, you know, with Hershey, with Troy Mann, who you had in Belleville, was a, a really yeah. high-end offensive coach for me. But, like, we had other good players that could have played on the power play. And, like, I couldn't have told Sheldon Keefe at the time that he was wrong. Like, they were there. The Marlies had had this historic season. But I get the look. Yeah. I didn't drop the ball. But 
you know, was I entirely deserving of that undivided look? I don't know. You know, obviously I did something with it. So, so you made you made the most of it for sure. And then like you're you're probably thinking like I can't miss. I can't miss right now. Like just shoot everything. Was, I've I've actually gone back over the course of even as I've gotten older and just like I can't believe some of the areas of the ice I would be in. Like like I, I have a goal against Bridgeport where I join as the fourth guy. I'm a right shot, you're a right shot. So we we normally join. It's a left side entry. It's like a four on two and a half, four on three. I'm the fourth guy. I kind of know I'm not going to get it. I'm on the other dot lane, which is where you usually are, right? You come right down the middle, there's all that congestion. You come down the far dot lane, you have an angle at the net. Yep. And uh, I don't get it. So for whatever reason, I kind of peel off. You know, I'm, I'm now I'm in the middle of the ice. I, for whatever reason, am skating backwards towards my own net now in the middle of the ice. I'm at like the top of circle. I hit my right edge. And I do an inside edge all the way to like the left dot, almost like the Ovechkin spot. <laughs> For whatever reason, Willie Nylander is making a cutback in the right corner, which would be my strong side corner. I just go to the back post. Sure. Why not? I just go to the back post five on five as a D-man. Yeah. Bang it in. Like that was my, I think it was my second goal of the night. Um, you know, just uncanny ability to find, you know, slots and spacing at that time. And, do you, it's do, you use Instat? do you use, use Instat? Do you have that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So last year was the first year I used it in Sweden because the team had the subscription and we all, got, we all got it. So I thought it was really cool and I'm using it for my games. And then all of a sudden the light bulb goes off in my head. I go, why don't I go back, check out some old games? So I start seeing what, what we got in old games and I find my last game that I played as a Leaf. I think it was in February of 2017. Was it, against the Rangers? It, was against, it was against the Rangers and you and oh, I are deep partners that day. And I don't know what you remember. I don't know what you remember about that game, but I have some I vivid that. memories. I have some I remember vivid well. memories. Yeah. What do you remember? The first thing that comes to mind is we got scored on in the first period. Yep. And I think, it was, I can't remember who it was, but I had cross-checked, I think it was Kreider. I had cross-checked him in the ribs. He was not happy on the play. But something happened, and you and I get scored on, and I could just feel, coming back to the bench, I could just feel that like there was like eyes, like lasers coming through the back of my head. And I don't know if you had that feeling too, but I did. <laughs> I, I remember talking to you before the game because you, know, you had a tough year. Right? I had played. I had played one game at that point. It's this was my game. first game. This was my first game since November. Which people and, and fans would, might have, no idea how difficult that is mentally no, and no, physically. No, and no. no sympathy either. And don't don't like. Yeah, I played some games on a conditioning stint for the Marlies. That like that's that's not a that doesn't prepare you to to play no. it. <laughs> completely different. Completely yeah. different. And uh, especially against a team like the Rangers that were particularly tough because they were streaky, right? Like they would just send a guy for a breakaway. Like they weren't. Yeah great but they were really dangerous offensively so it was a game that you'd win a lot of times but it was really stressful for d-men because you know yeah. they had a, they had a, it, i think the goal was michael grabner was it not off a breakaway that was later that was late so the, the first one was we were playing down low and we i i don't know i gotta find this clip i'll find it and send it to you we were playing down low we tried to i tried to keep the puck going it hit a shin pad all of a sudden we're in the corner now try and get in our structure rangers make a couple passes to someone in the slot and where it's like a missed assignment and boom it's in the back of the net and all i'm thinking is you got to be like we couldn't my get through the first that. period like we couldn't get through the first period <laughs> my favorite was when he'd come down and he'd, he'd talk to the d coach and be like he doesn't have it tonight he's done he'd oh. t- t- he's done tonight he doesn't have oh, it. oh yeah oh yeah but we got split up like we got split up shortly thereafter like we i we were not allowed on the ice together after that, I remember. I remember there was a, a face off. There was an ozone draw, and we never ran face off plays. Right, it was just our style. We always sent two to the net, and it was just a, yeah, a shot and start the ozone structure, try and go a little high, ping pong it, hammer it again. Yeah, and uh, we win. We win the draw soft, and I start. To, uh, our winger looks right at me, and so I start to lunge forward because I'm like, oh, this can be a nice offensive chance. And we just duff it, and it like right. bounces by me in the neutral zone. So I'm leaning forward, 
Michael Grabner's on the outside, of course. Like, yeah, good luck. Just goes knee to chest, full road runner, you know, breakaway. I can't remember if he scored or not. And I'll just. I I'll do remember that clip now. I remember that now. I was on the bench because we weren't allowed on the ice anymore together. <laughs> I remember the next uh, the next day we sh- they the coaching staff showed the clip, and uh, you know, uh, Babcock said something like, "And for Christ's sake, he's like, you gotta skate here." I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, you know, this Michael Grabner is pretty quick north south, and like I had a losing start to go to start with, and. Oh, oh man. you want to you want to talk about a time you had bad luck in your career? So in that game, that game against the Rangers, we're off, like I'm off to a not very good start. OK, and we're split up. We're not allowed on the ice together. I think at this point, though, I had been on for a goal four. So I'm even I'm feeling pretty good about myself. The fact that I got myself back to even on paper and I'm like, OK. We can we can get going here, you know. Like we got it back. Let's let's keep it going. I have a shift where I'm still playing my offside now because I'm playing with Poli. Pull out. Yep. Hit Bozak in the middle. Nice breakout pass. I'm like perfect getting off the ice. That was great. Great shift, man. You know, I'm telling myself this stuff on the ice. You know, like you have to. Oh, yeah. So then we end up having it, it's um it's a face off just outside our blue line. Playing my offside. Puck comes back to me. I go to touch it over to Poli. This thing grenades right over my stick. Like, how many times did you just touch the puck, boom, make a pass, and it was flat the whole time? Great. This thing grenades right over my stick. And I can't remember if it was Kreider or Grabner or one of those guys. But they, they're coming right at me full speed, obviously. So he pushes the puck ahead. I give him the hook, you know, and I'm off to the box. And there it's off the rails again. It's off the rails because it's just a shit bounce. And and now it's it's hard for me to recover because I'm mind fucked as it is. And I think I ended up getting another penalty too later in the game. It was it was not a good scene for me, buddy. I was and I was I watched the media afterwards and I was like, Yeah, I don't know, it was not bad. I really wanted to say it was fucking dog shit is what it was. (laughs) Yeah. Well like let's let's talk a little about like the resilience from that, because like I you know, I was always an anxious kid and playing in that environment, you know, was was difficult for me um, from a performance perspective. And I can see it now. Like I go back and I watch old games. I'm like, I, that, that doesn't skate like me. Like that, that doesn't even look like the same player. Um, oh, yeah. I get that. As I am, as I, as I am you know, as, as I was yesterday for the Marlies and as I was the, the next year when I was gone in, in Dallas, whatever. Um, but it's really led me down a path of, you know, I've, I've, you know, I'm into the meditation. I know you are too. Yeah. Um, you know, very exploratory in, you know, the breath work and, and how it's able to manipulate, you know, the nervous system, things like that. You work with some high end, you know, physical practitioners, uh, you know, Peter Renzetti, uh, Dr. Aubrey Green, you know, Maddie Nickel. Um, like, you're better for it. Oh, yeah. You're I better think the for meditation. It. The meditation is the biggest thing that I've done, I think, that helps me on a day-to-day basis. Taking that 10 minutes to just calm things down, breathe, get your mind in the right space. I find I started doing it midday. I used to, I was always doing it at like weird times. I don't know if if you ever experienced that, like just because of the way the schedule is, you know, sometimes you can do it in the morning, whatever. Did you, did you ever hear about this thing about sleep deprived people? Um, I can't remember the exact thing it was, but it was like they took sleep deprived people, people who had legitimate insomnia, and they had them meditate between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. every single day. And apparently that was like the the golden hour, I guess, to meditate. And it helped. It was one of the things that helped cure these people of this insomnia. Oh. I don't know if you ever heard that. Yeah. No, no. Yeah, yeah, I found that interesting. So every day between 10 and 2, that's like my window to try and try and get 10 minutes in. I like it in the morning, but, you know, I, I also just like getting up and, and doing my thing in the morning, you know, kind of writing my schedule down. And where, where I've really found it helpful is is that post-practice where it's like, because it's, it's almost like you have in pro hockey, you have really three days, like three segments in a day. You have sort of your morning and practice. These are practice days. Your yeah. morning and your practice schedule. 
Then you've got that lunch, you know, post skate fatigue, you know, yeah. kind of window and then bedtime, fun time. You know, I live with my wife, so, you know, movie time, dinner, whatever. And they're, they're really pretty distinct pockets. And I find, uh, you know, sort of a post-practice reset really helps me re-energize for sure. Uh, pay attention when I'm home because usually I'm replaying practice or or whatever coach said or or whatever you know went down in video that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and it really helps me be you know present there and kind of reset. I had a uh, I had a health practitioner tell me you know she was she was giving me this story, and she's like you know do do you spend time in calm states on purpose? You know do you spend time in? And I was like well. I mean, I consider myself a decently calm person. Like I claim I have great, you know, poise at the puck. Like I, I think I'm a calm person. Yeah. She's like, I don't know. Between the caffeine and the big hits and the light nights and the M&M and the 50 cent and, you know, music up to 10. She's like, you're grooving your brain. You're shaping your brain towards these, these really high, you know, energy states. Right. Uh, and she goes, you know, she goes, Connor, I have a lot of like Wall Street uh, clients, for example, that are done now. They made all their money. They they did the thing. They they you know accomplished their dream, and now they're retired and living in Puerto Rico or Cabo, wherever. She goes, and they still think like the lions at the door. Like they cannot calm down because they haven't built this circuitry in their brain. Th- right. These pathways are, are a, it's a foreign language to them to feel this way. They they cannot understand it. It's not accessible yeah. to them. Uh, and it won't be accessible to you unless you groove, uh, you, you floss these patterns into yourself. And it really kind of helped me understand like, okay, if you do not practice this space, it will not be available to you. You will miss it entirely. It's funny that you mentioned the music too, because I was always a guy that like, I need my playlist before the game. I need the volume loud. I need these songs and I need to feel that. Is it like an endorphin rush? I need to feel that before the game. Or else I would like get worried. I'd get stressed out before the game. I'm like, oh, I don't, I haven't felt that yet. Like I don't have it. Am I going to be able to play this this game? And as I've gotten older now, I've realized that the more I put myself in that state with the Metallica and the Eminem and whatever you want, whatever it is, I'm like, you you can't. I almost find I couldn't hold that state, so I would like drop off too much, and then I would try and get it back up, and then I would drop off too much. And so now, even with music, and I'm a big music guy, I love music, I play the guitar, I love rock, I love, you know, any, I love anything. And so now I find myself listening to things that are like a little more chilled out, because I know that if I keep bringing myself up to that point, there's the drop off and it's coming. And like, I'm a big caffeine guy, too. We're just we're coffee snobs in this household, big time. (laughs) We might have, I think we have like, four or five different contraptions to make coffee with here. So like, and there's no chance. I'm just never cutting out caffeine. I'll tell you right now, there's two to three coffees a day minimum. Yeah. It's a sad, uh, once it hits 201 PM, that's my cutoff. That's a sad time of the day. Cause I'm like, you know, what am I going to do? Dude, uh, we say, we say my wife and I say the same thing and it'll be like four o'clock. We're like, ah, I'm so pissed. Can't have another coffee today. I can't wait. <laughs> can't wait to have a coffee tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So but, what about uh, some of the injuries you've had? You had a pretty nasty ankle sprain, grade three. You had the ACL reconstruction. You had the yeah. quad tendon tear we were talking about. Uh, you yeah. know, what about yourself? Have you learned, uh, you know, concerning that? Because I think that that I, I'll go first. Like, I remember I separated my shoulder my first year in Hershey. And like, I legitimately thought, I'm like, oh, man, I had a good run. Like, yeah. I'm being like, I'll never get back in the lineup. Like we have so many good defensemen. The team's winning yeah. now. We had 11 defensemen with NHL experience my first year with the Hershey Bears. Yeah. And I'm like, we'd lose a game in like five D-men. <laughs> five D-men would come out of the lineup. <laughs> and I'd be like, yeah, I'm just never going to get in. This is it for me. And yeah. uh, just naive, like you were saying earlier. Yeah. And, and, you know, I had a, a lesser injury earlier in my career. I think it was my second year with, second year pro with the Canucks and I went back for a puck. I twisted weird and something happened and it was just this sharp pain in my abdomen. And I was called up. Like I was called up. I was playing a regular shift and I'm like, 
there's no way I'm just not leaving this game. Like this pain's just going to go away and, and I'm not leaving this game. I don't care how bad it hurts. And Talk about a trauma, up, by the way, total denial, <laughs> total, total denial. This is like, this is therapy session stuff. Like this is what yeah. I talk about with a therapist. And so I'm like in pain, whatever, but I'm not leaving this game. I'm not even telling anyone in so much pain. Anyways, finish the game, play horrible, just an, absolute mockery of the game at one point i think i had a 10 foot lead um on someone to beat out an icing and they beat me for the icing like that's how bad this this game was for me anyways next day get to the rink i'm in pain again but we have an optional skate i'm like no it's going on fuck it i'm going on anyways can't shoot the puck just so much pain end up telling them like listen i'm in i'm in a lot of pain we got to get this thing figured out had a torn oblique Torn oblique, but that, that's just, I don't know if it's me or if that's, I'm different or, or if you can relate to that, you have, you you're called up, you're playing a regular shift and all of a sudden this thing happens and you're like, I can't give this up. Like I, I am so afraid that if I leave, if I give up this spot, someone's going to take it and I'm never coming back. And it sounds so stupid now when I listen to myself talk about it and someone else is probably listening, thinking like you're an idiot, but I don't care, man. You're not in that position. You don't understand what it's like to, to, to think that. It's just you're not thinking rational. I remember reading about – it was an, I, I can't remember the book. It was about uh, the, a you know, study of different um, economic psychology, and they were talking about like the most timid investor, you know, someone you know, without a lot of income – you know, really has no problem kind of risking it for the biscuit because they, they've already been broke. Uh, there's really only upside, you know, they can do, they can can elevate their lifestyle permanently if this hits in whatever they're investing in. And then, you know, there's the wealthy, right? You know, let's think very wealthy. They've, they've got money to blow. So it's, it's worth it for them to have some risk in their portfolio because, you know, they really can, uh, outnumber their losses. They've got deep pockets and over the course of time, they'll hit more than they lose and, and they're, they end up winners, right? Uh, but the most risk averse person was like the middle class who had, who had just risen there, that the person who had had a poorer life and had finally kind of risen through the ranks, the socioeconomic right. ranks, had a dollar to lose and then it would hurt, right? And that, that's the depth player in the NHL. They are yeah. just there and they are constantly. Rem- Listen, there's two types of players in the NHL there's guys who check the lineup when they walk in, and there's guys who don't. <laughs> buddy i already checked the lineup every day no matter what first thing i did before i took off my street clothes right to the lineup well go check it out race like can't wait uh you know to see it actually you know sometimes you're you, you can wait you're more nervous um yeah you know otherwise but like it it uh I, I had the same thing in dallas i i was playing against dallas playing really well we were talking about this before um you know fizzled out in toronto uh, knew I wasn't going to be a part of the team. I had had like two and a half years there where I was, you know, in more than I was out. That second full year, I ended up stringing together like 50 some games, but just like a horseshoe up my ass. Like, uh, you know, a lot of big injuries. There was actually like premium ice time available. Um, was going to do okay. Got waived and traded on the same day to Dallas. I think there were three teams that had put a claim in on me or we're going to, according to my agent. And then, you know, he kind of found a way to get me traded to Dallas. I'm playing eight games, 10 games, whatever it is. And I've got a handful of points. I'm plus a couple, a couple big, um, you know, goals and things like that. And uh, I lo- we were strict man on man, which is rare now in the NHL. You don't see that zones. anymore. Yeah. You don't see it very often. And I am clinging to my guy on the backside, right? Like uh, the puck goes up top to John, I think it was Jonathan Erickson. He goes cross. Trevor Daly's a left shot, so he's taking a one timer. And my guy decides to go to the back side of the net, so I kind of cling to him, and I look left, and all this puck smokes me in the like right on the ankle bone, right in that you know uh, dome yeah. on the inside of your. And I mean, like I couldn't see; I was in so much pain, like like right. just the right, trauma response. Like the whole rink went red, black. Uh, I end up. I remember watching the shift. I'm like. I almost get hit by another puck because I'm like shaking it off, but I'm directly behind the net. So like, I didn't even know where I was in time and space. And uh, it was the end of the period, get it x-rayed looks like nothing. So 
great, you know, but the X-ray machine at the rink wasn't wasn't working very well apparently. Play the rest of that game. I'm I am purposely line changing every time Dylan Larkin or Thanos you come on the ice because I'm like if though if I got to catch one of these guys I'm dead like I'm I'm yeah, gonna yeah. lose by a mile. Yeah, those guys can. Fly. And uh, I remember the end of the second. I end up. This is what every defenseman dreams of, right? Top four. I'm playing with Miro Ice getting in. You know, he's going to go on to be an NHL All Star stud. Um, you know, on a good defensive team, like all I've got to do is kind of do my job, like sift a couple pucks, pick up some points, stay that's plus. It. Find have your my guy off. Have, have your Find assignments in the D zone. And that's it. And it's yeah. a simple game, right? It's a very yeah. vanilla, simple game, and I can do well. And I played Funny, 22 minutes in the greens. Fairway to green. That's all that's it, it is. <laughs> Pars, right? <laughs> um, and uh, I played 22 minutes that night, and I, all I could think about is like, they, how are they missing that I suck? <laughs> I'm ter- and Ben Bishop, I'll never forget. He was one of the more he, he was a riot to play with. He was extremely vocal. He would yell at you mid shift. I'd never seen it before. So oh, like yeah. if you were a demon and you would come back on a puck, let's say he wanted you to wheel to the weak side, he'd be yelling wheel. So wheel, but for whatever reason, let's say I already set my angle to go up the strong side. Yeah. He would yell, like, I told you to wheel. Like, as you're making your play, you're like, <laughs> thanks. Fine. Yeah. Anyway, oh. He's just competitive, but he, uh, and so he yells at me at the end of the second period. He's like, the fuck are you doing out here? You're spinning around like a top in D zone. I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, yep, you're right. You're absolutely <laughs> right. <laughs> I am. I sure Not am. Not pivot off my right foot, you know, yeah. at all. Like I couldn't cross my my foot under. Like I couldn't do a crossover to my right, right uh, at all because it would just crunch into that part Dude, of my boot. Um, you know what's you know what's interesting? I read this book in my career, and I don't. It's an older book. It's probably written in the '90s, and it's it's funny that it's written in the '90s because it's called the New Mental Toughness Training for Sports. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Oh, um, but it follows tennis mostly. But I, I find it's very relatable to hockey, and. There's one chapter and you're reading this book and then you know how the chapter comes up and the chapter is called No One Cares. And basically the sentiment behind that chapter is like, take your situation. You have a bum foot or a broken leg in that situation. But guess what? Ben Bishop doesn't care because you're not pivoting properly. And that's the only thing that matters in that situation. I had a torn oblique and I played like shit. But no one cares because the only thing that matters is winning that game. And you can go on and on and you can find different examples of this. But at the end of the day, if we put ourselves in these positions, we still have to perform because guess what? No one cares. I, th- I think it's such a good lesson for young players, especially because, you know, like that's just not that's not something you realize at, at a young age, I find. I think that comes with maturity. Well, and, you know, something else I, I've you, that comes with maturity is like, Yes, you always want to gut it out for the team, but no one does care, and you do have to do your best over the course of your career. Like you've been at it since when? Two thousand and nine now, yeah. Right, really two thousand nine since you played in the OHL, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I played in the OHL. Twenty twelve was my first year, so we've been pros for you know a long time, ten and you know thirteen years essentially, right? Yeah. And uh, like I, I've I've learned that. Like I I used to kind of give myself a pat on the back. I'd play with the flu. And like, I'd be out there eight seconds and be looking for the exit. Be dying. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now now looking ahead, I'm like, yes, there's a certain level of toughness. If your coach asked you to play, right? Like say you approach them and say, I don't think I can go. And they say, listen, I get it, but I just need you on the power play. Like do whatever you need to do to just be good those two minutes. Yeah. All right. Well, now now you and your coach made a a team first, you know, and a a person first decision, right? Like they, they aligned. Yeah. Um. I, I just went through like I had a I had a block shot the other night, and I'm out there in the second period. I'm like, I'm I'm what it's the American Hockey League. You know it. It's a physical style of hockey. Like yeah. guys are looking to take guys' heads off every shift. I'm like, pretty simple. I can't if someone tries to hit me right now. I can't avoid them. I'm like I I have to go come up with another solution yeah. because like no one's gonna care if, if I get hurt worse, right? And I didn't no. have you know, frankly, the, the leadership skill to, to pull myself out um, right. and figure out a solution because this, what, what's going on right now is not doable. Will you, will you rim pucks? Will you rim pucks? Oh, I got a breakout? Yeah. Hey, if you go back no. behind the net, you'll rim them? 
Oh yeah. I remember there was a part of a part of my career, and I feel like this was probably in Toronto too. There was like an anti rimming the puck philosophy. Did you feel that? Yeah. Did you feel that way? So uniquely, when I got to Toronto, the hardest it, it was almost an entire flip of what I was used to. So in yeah. Hershey, where I was coming from, we were strictly in a, a weak side team. Yeah. Kept a lot of pucks on the walls on purpose. Um and we had a ton of creativity. And you played for Troy, man. High F3, lots of one three one looks, you know, in the adjusted offensive zone. Scoring. Adjusted scoring, man. Like yeah, no, shoot no, for the back he, shot, never did, hit the goalie. Yeah. Did he say no red shots? Was he was he yelling yeah. at? Yeah. Outside. No red, yeah. Yeah, no red Game shots. Shot. Yeah. And I really liked that. And then Toronto was the direct opposite. Like yeah. only middle pop plays, like no yeah. builds neutral zone only right up and only hammer the puck immediately like no dragging or anything in the old, in the offensive blue line and it was like completely the opposite in every zone it was yeah, really difficult I, I found that really weird playing for babcock because i always thought he was like this puck possession guy i always thought he was like this you know detroit plays this nice style with puck possession and i'm in the dressing room i'm like this guy literally just wants us to quick up everything hammer pucks up the ice like at one point, I don't know if you remember this, in a neutral zone situation, puck would go D to D to you on the right side. The weak side winger was cutting right across the ice because you were going up and it was tip and he wanted that weak side winger getting in on the forecheck. And I've never seen that before. Usually that weak side winger comes nice and low. Maybe you pop a seam, cra- seam pass across. I thought that was, that was strange. I'd never seen that before, but I did the opposite. I came from Toronto where it was like, go back for pucks, eat a hit and try and like shovel this thing to the middle of the ice. And I found we'd get hit a lot. And yep. then I go, like I go to Bell. Well, Pittsburgh was a dink team. Pittsburgh was like a, you make those little dink that passes. Wall, yeah, wall, 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 dink, net dink. Wall, yeah, yeah, exactly. Which I didn't mind, but, but it, it kind of brings everyone low into the zone. It, it might be a little slower, but. I go to Belleville, I'm playing for Troy Mann, and he's like, no, weak side. We want to break out the weak side, rim that bitch, and we'll get the puck out and we'll go skate onto it. And I'm like, this is great. I'm not getting hit as much anymore. I'm not in my zone as much anymore. And it's like, I understand these these minor hockey, you know, you teach kids not to just rely on rimming pucks, but you talk about the AHL, guys are coming to put you through the boards. I'm going to rim that sucker sometimes because it's just what you need to do, man. Yeah, no, I agree. And it's interesting now, the older we get in pro, just the, the, the difference uh, of fits out there and how much it matters for, you know, the, the way you want to play. I mean, it, it's cool right now. So I'm with Charlotte and we have a dual affiliate. So I got to go through Seattle's camp and then our, our head coach, uh, Jordy Kieran is, is, you know, mainly a, a, he was elected by Florida, right? Like we have a Florida Panther patch on our jersey. So it's maybe it's 51, 49, you know, Florida, whatever. But we're super integrated as a group. I'd say some of the offensive principles might, they have a flavor more of Florida, if I had to yeah. guess. And I haven't been, I was, I spent an entire two days with the Seattle Kraken this year. So I don't entirely understand their offensive plan because, you know, I'm sure they've yeah. changed things since training camp. Um. But it's it's pretty sick. Like they want to attack. Like they want to take guys on. They need guys to use their backhand. They and it's a good fit. They they want their defensemen involved. They want you know uh, if you can hit the top D man for him to slide and that other D man like you're just taking off towards the back post and like it's the top yeah. guy's job to sort it out. And it's interesting. Like you know I remember um, I was playing for the Leafs and and we were like we were saying. Like uh, like pinball flippers at the top, right? It was an automatic shoot immediately, which I think yeah. is a skill. It's a skill play yeah. sometimes. Yeah. And I had a coach from that I consult with in the summer, and he basically said, Connor, like I don't know what else to tell you, but like you're like your your numbers in terms of percentage of getting the puck on net, or or even like a scoring chance, or even your team just gets it back, is is really tough. Really? Um, numbers are awful. And I don't know what to tell you. I know I don't want to tell you what not to do what your coach said. And so finally we agreed, like, I'm just going to 
kind of add my flavor, you know, I'm going to dust it off as, you know, oh, for, yeah. for a second and, and get the sifter through. Cause yeah. that was what I was really good at. That's what I produced all those points with the Marlies with. That's what, you know, th- those backside shots for tips. And, and we had some guys with great hands that could tip, you know, JVR and yeah. timing was at the net a lot. And my yeah, second Brownie, year off. Brownie was sniffing better. around a lot. Much better. Um, yeah. Just with a little bit of, I want to say calculated, you know, rebelliousness was really served my game well. It's funny that you have to think about it as calculated rebelliousness because holding the puck an extra half second should not be seen that way. You know, it should just be a normal well, it's, thing. It's like, but you, you have to think about it that way because that's how strict it was at the time. It was. And it, you know what? It's funny. I remember moving on and being in Dallas and in Jersey. And I don't know if you experienced this, but I would make a mistake that I remember being a mistake under, you know, the, the coaching staff we're on. And like everything was very permanent. If you'll remember, like if you made a mistake, like your ice time would be docked for like, you, you wouldn't like miss shifts. You miss shifts for like five straight games. It was hard. Yeah, exactly. If it, if it went perfect, you'd get like two more minutes. Yes. Right. And then those five had to go perfect. So like you could yeah. with one bad shift, screw yourself up for 10, 15 games. Really? That's what it felt like. Maybe it was. I felt know, that. Inaccurate. I don't know about, I don't know about 10 or 15, but I definitely felt that it could, it could kind of compound into, into the next game and the game after that a little bit. But I will say like, I probably learned a little bit. Like, I'm not going to say I probably did. I learned a lot about hockey because our video sessions I found were really good. Like I found yeah. I could, I could, I found, cause they were short too. They were like five minutes long, but it was like right to the point and you could understand things and I'll give them credit in that regard. I won't give them credit in any other regard other than that, uh, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, That's but the, 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 the one that I think, his the D zone coverage, three one on ones low, two guys on the rail. You must remember that. Yep. The three one on ones low now. I think I think that's like that's done now. The one on ones low. You need layers. You need like guys are too good. Like I don't know. You're playing in the American League. You must see it. Like guys are making these nice plays in tight spaces, and guys are really sprinting to the net, and you can't cross check them as much anymore. I think you just need a little more of a, a layer protection there. I've been talking about it on the radio here in Toronto like crazy because it seems like seems like Keith is or that that this Toronto team has done a a little bit of a different philosophy now in the D zone. I could be wrong, but yeah, I think I think uh, you know we run it similar to Florida and Seattle. They both have the same D zone coverage, and it's basically you know a demon in the corner grinding, a center helping him out, uh, strong side and weak side winger both kind of sheltering, and then the strong side, you know the the wingers i think have a good responsibility in terms of like okay if the if the down low offense is under duress sure take away you know your strong side demon and try and pick a puck off yeah uh, if if their eyes are available and and they're exerting their will on us a little bit like protect the inside and hope for a relief to the top and then engage five one on ones and everyone do your your yeah, box yeah that's out when it turns play. into a one on one when it goes up top I agree with that. And what, and what I really like too is like, I remember we were all over like boxing out was everything like dude, heaven forbid. Right. And we play a little bit now. And I think I see it in Florida's game. I don't watch Seattle as much as because of the time difference, but um, we do like a really nice job of like at the net. I feel like if we need to box out, we do. Yeah. If we feel the puck's getting to the point and it's like going to be a, a, a bullshit shot we'll front it yeah or if we think it's going to be a, a hope rim below we'll pluck it off yeah and like cut it off right and and we're just good at that read whatever it is there, there's almost yeah. no rule from the coach other than like hey i need you to do what's right we used to do right? so much box out in practice i don't know if you oh, felt man. that way too yep. practice was a grind guess, lots, lots practice, of box right. um Practice so, so was, tell me it about, wasn't grind and it wasn't though, because we would practice some days for like 25 minutes, just feel the puck a little bit and get off. Yeah, that was my problem was I, I didn't feel like as a depth player, I got the opportunity to work on my game because we get like kicked off the ice and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And it was like a, like all of a sudden you'd be on a three on two against Carey Price 
and you get the puck on the backside. And like Carey Price has faced this shot a thousand times in the last month. Oh, yeah. And this is my first shot inside the blue line in six weeks. Yeah. Like, yeah. like his save percentage is already a nine three. Like, what do you think it is now? You know what I mean? No, for sure. Um, for sure. And uh, I always found that odd. I, I agree with the video. I thought our video was great. I thought we did a great job of like, understanding the the previous piece like if our breakouts weren't good it wasn't because all of a sudden our defensemen sucked it's because we weren't holding anybody up in the neutral zone right and that's yeah. why the guys in you know if if yeah that if was the stuff we learned that was yeah i sure. really like that um really like that you know tell me about uh some of the tv stuff you're doing with tsn now how's that going yeah man. We have play you, you played over in europe yeah like, tie that all in one like how, how how's yeah. it been? We'll bring it home here. We'll, we'll bring it home. Last. Yeah. So last year I made the decision to go overseas, played in Sweden, enjoyed it. Great culture, great way of life there. Really nice people. Um, and then caught co- dude. Fantastic. That's serious coffee culture, right? It's Fika? Serious. Fika? Yeah. Fika is a big deal. And their coffee is really strong. Like if you like strong coffee, that's the place to be. It was great. Actually, I've really missed the coffee. That's the thing I miss the most about it. Um, but yeah, right. went, went, went down. yeah, <laughs> went, went, <laughs> went pretty good there and got a KHL offer with Riga. So I went over there and, um, obviously great opportunity and, you know, just kind of some hip injuries that compounded, compounded and lingered. And I wasn't able to really get on the right side of it. So decided to come home and, and take care of things. And I'm actually still trying to figure out exactly what the problems are. You know, the, I've addressed a few things now, but still not quite where I need to be. So in the meantime, I, um, I got asked to do a, a phone in hit, uh, by this guy named Al's brother, who's an absolute legend in Toronto, the, uh, Toronto media scene. So he asked me to do a call in hit and, uh, went pretty good. And then after that, the, the producer for the show asked if I had any interest in, uh, co-hosting a couple of days because the co-host was going to be covering the world juniors, the other co-host. So I said, yeah, sure. I'd love to. Did that. And then um, from there, one of the TV producers reached out and asked if I had any interest in um, doing some work with the CHL on TSN, new product that they have going. And so I'm on the panel Friday nights with Carlo Koliakovo, another former defenseman. Uh, Yeah, yeah, really good guy. He helps me a lot. And in the meantime, now I'm actually doing more radio. I'm doing I'm doing the Leafs, man. I'm covering our old team. I got pregame show. A uh, half hour pregame show on the radio, do the intermissions, and do an hour postgame show on TSN 1050. Which, uh, yeah, so you know I got to stay in the loop a little bit. You know I don't I don't really bug any of the boys for any scoops or anything like that. I try and try and watch and, and get things the uh, you know the honest way. Um, but the the TV like the radio is fun. They're both fun. Like the, the radio is fun because it's like this. We have a conversation, we talk, and, and it's a little more free wheel. The TV was interesting because you have the earpiece in, you have like a certain amount of time you can talk for. So, you know, if they come to us on the panel, we probably have about two minutes. Host brings us in, sets us up, tees me up. Now I probably got about 40 seconds. And in my ear, they're saying, okay, and camera four. And you're looking at camera four. And then they say, okay, now we're going to go to camera one. And you got to turn your head. And you still got to keep talking <laughs> and, and make sense and not say, um, and, and, and you know, and, but, and all these things, right, that, that we say on a, such a constant level. And so you have to, you know, it's like you want to have a nice little introduction get into your meat and potatoes of it and then tie it up with a nice bow and then send it back to the host. That's kind of the way, that's kind of the way I see it. But, and then during the game, you know, you're sitting there in the game and you have your piece in and your mic and you're talking to the control room. You're like, okay, if we're covering, let's say Connor Bedard, because we had his game. Oh, I really like that spin that Connor Bedard just did. Can you clip it? It's at 1643. Thanks. And you're just doing that all period. And then as we get closer to the periods end, they're like, okay, what are you guys thinking for intermission? What are we going to... So you say, okay, I like that that clip at 16, 43, the clip at 14, the clip at 12, package those together. I'm going to talk about Bedard's poise with the puck. Boom. And then come back in and same thing. We're looking at camera four. We come in. There's, okay, camera one. And then you're, you're talking again, man. So it's cool. It's fun. It's, it's, it's engaging. That's the, the word I'll use to describe it. It's very engaging. Yeah. And, and uh, 
you know, I, I've been able to watch some of the clips that I've been able to find on Twitter and stuff like that. I think you're doing a great job and it's, <laughs> uh, it, it's fun. It, it's fun to just express yourself. Right. And, and, yeah. and be a part of the game in different ways. And I think that was always our dream is to be the top four D men making, you know, four and a half million a year and, walk yeah. the blue line the way. and, you know, we've done that in stints, but, you know, there, there's other ways to love on this game and, and, and be good to it. It's been good to us in a lot of ways, challenge us in a lot of ways. But um, I don't know, age is uh, – you – at least for me, I've int- I've tended to improve my relationship with the past. Yeah, me too. Um, me too. As I've gotten older and, and, and it's found different ways to to serve me. So it's been really – it's been interesting. And, I, and I've always, you know, rooted for you. I, I, we were in direct competition. That's a difficult thing to do, you know, yeah. being young, being right shots. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's a, it's a hard thing to do as young pros, you know, there's only so many, so many cookies, only so much ice time. And, and uh, you know, we're always, you know, good to each other. And, and um, I'm rooting for you, man. I hope you get healthy. Thank you. Yeah. You get healthy. I hope your next, uh, your next hit is something you really, you really enjoy. Thanks buddy. It was nice to do this. I'm sure we could talk for days, but uh yeah, we'll leave it at that, and we'll maybe we'll yeah, do another keep, one. You keep uh, you keep doing things in uh, in Toronto. I'm super interested to to pick your brain further on the radio and then the TV yeah. stuff, and and we can talk about that, and and even about you know maybe we do something or you know just because you're probably watching more NHL hockey than I am right now. Um, you know maybe we do uh, like a, a playoff series uh, where we we kind of go through some of the teams, and I'll I'll freshen up as it gets closer here because I've always wanted to take my podcast a little bit more into the hockey side. I avoided a little bit just to avoid, you know, what you're talking yeah, about yeah. inside school, talking about yeah, your yeah. friends. And, exactly. And exactly. a little funky, but at the same time, I think there's a, a special light you know, that guys like you and I can, can shine on, on certain plays and, and, you know, help, uh, help grow our game that way and, and educate people. So it's been a lot of fun, man. Yeah, man. Good stuff. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. See you, bud. Bye.